Our reading this morning, as I said, this is 1 John 2, starting at verse 15, through into chapter 3 and finishing at verse 10. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that and the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for they had, had they been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out, that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have written to you because you do not know, because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son of the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence that, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you knew that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has his, this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he has manifest to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, and he might, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love him his brother. Thank you for that very warm welcome. Um, it's been really lovely just to you know, talk to some of you this morning already. Um, and it, it's always encouraging for anyone training for the ministry or in the ministry to uh, visit another Bible-believing church, another you know, church of faith and believers, and um, have, uh, allow us to be encouraged in that way. Well, my wife and I are expecting uh, a son in September. Um, we are excited, a bit nervous, uh, if we're honest. Uh, but one of the things I've reflected on, personally, is I want him to know uh, that I am his father and that I love him dearly, even though I can't yet see him and I can't yet hold him. But as soon as he has the mental ability, I want him to know that he is my son. I want him to know that I love him with a special love that I do not share with anyone else's child. And in a similar vein, our passage this morning 
1 John chapter 2, verse 28 to chapter 3, verse 10, deals with the similar issue of how we may know with joy and with assurance that we are children of God. But before we get into the text, um, please quickly pray with me again as we uh, devote this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in this Lord's day. We rejoice that it is the day that we remember uh, Christ risen from the dead. Christ ascended in heaven, reigning on high, sitting as King. Uh, we thank you for the songs we could sing to honour him. And we thank you for this time that we have uh, to learn from your word. Please be with me. Keep me from error and sin. And help me to speak the truth of me in love. In Christ. Amen. So, the Apostle John wrote this epistle uh, probably late in the first century AD uh, to encourage Christian churches uh, in their faith as they dealt with issues relating to a number of things relating to false teaching, uh, lawlessness, and apostasy. Now John clearly states in chapter 5, verse 13, that he writes this book. Uh, in chapter 5, verse 13, he writes these things to those who believe in the name of the Son of God, that they may know that they have eternal life. Now some of the errors around at this time uh, compromised on the Incarnation. Uh, that's just a theological word uh, to point to Jesus coming in physical flesh. Many apostates at the time, influenced by Greek philosophy of Plato, believed Jesus only appeared to be a man and did not come, uh, did not dirty himself with physical flesh. Chapter 2, verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went, went out, that it might become plain they all were not of us. There were also other false teachers, though, who taught that it was possible to be a Christian uh, and yet live in unrepentant sin. There we go. Just missing that. Deceivers and antichrists abounded during this time, and many have been sold this lie. That though the gospel saves, uh, one can believe the gospel and yet live uh, like a son of Satan. So John writes this epistle to strengthen and encourage the Christian church, uh, strengthen those who have remained in the faith, who confess Christ as the true Son of God, and to encourage them to abide in Christ, reject sin and live holy lives. So in our text this morning, uh, John writes so that Christians may know that they are children of God. He writes, uh, so that we know until Christ appears, abide in Him as children of God, rejecting the works of the devil. Uh, we have two headings for today. Firstly, children of God abide in Christ, uh, from verse 28 of chapter 2 to Verse 3 of chapter 3, and children of God reject the works of the devil, from verse 4 to verse 10. So firstly, children of God abide in Christ. So please look with me to verse 28. I'm running with the uh, ESV. Um, I know there was a different translation, but that's okay. All good. Uh, verse 28, and now little children... Abide in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from Him in shame at His coming. John issues a command to abide in Him. Now, we need to read, whenever we read the Bible, we need to read our text in context to answer the question of what it means to abide in Him. We can't just make up what we think that might mean. So if we look back to chapter 2, verse 24, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. So, we abide in the Son, 
by believing that Jesus is the Christ, that he is who he claims to be, the eternal word of God, uh, eternally begotten, but not created. However, there is one more element here. Chapter 2, verse 27 explains how the Holy Spirit teaches the children of God everything. Those who abide in Christ are those who are shown to be born of the Spirit, born of God. And the implication of being born of God, right, is that they are children of God. If my son is born of me, of my wife, then he is our child. Abiding in Christ also means to live in the Spirit, to commune with God daily through the Word and through prayer. It means we gather on the Lord's day, like today, to hear God's Word, to pray, to sing songs, to uh, participate in biblical worship. It means we do not quench or we do not grieve the Spirit through participating in habitual sin. Verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Now, uh, my background is from a uh, maths engineering background, so in the study of maths and logic, there is this idea of a corollary or a necessary consequence. And what basically what this means is, is if something is a necessary consequence of another thing, that if something is true, that other thing has to also be true, even if it's not explicitly stated. So here John is saying, because God is righteous, it is a necessary consequence that those that are born of Him will practice righteousness. They will, uh, in other words, children of God, because they have been born of Him, are by nature inclined towards righteousness. And I know that is a tall order. I know it's hard, but look, I'm not making it up. It's what the text says. Verse 1 of chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that we did not know Him. The Spirit of God goes where it wills, if we love God, it is because He first loved us. It is not because we were good or we were righteous. The person who tries without God to clean themselves up, to kind of wash themselves and be good out of their own self-determination is not a child of God. Righteous living follows from our adoption as children of God. It does not qualifies it, not, it does not prepare us to be children of God. It follows from our status as His children. But how do we become children of God in the first place? And what does it mean for us to be children of God? To start with, John says our status as children, God's children or God's sons is given to us by His, uh, by his Father in His love. When you study the idea of sonship, of adoption, in the whole Bible, starting from the start of the Bible, you start to see that the idea of being children or sons of God goes all the way back to creation itself. You know, Jesus is not the first person to be called God's son. Adam was called the son of God, Luke 3.38. He was the first created man to bear God's image in this state of innocence. But we all know the story. Adam did not live as the Son of God should have. As God's appointed region over creation, he failed to maintain order in his domain. And he allowed the ancient serpent to enter the sanctuary, not only to deceive his wife, but to deceive him as well. And learning that Eve was deceived by the serpent, instead of interceding on her behalf before God, instead of pleading before God and taking, uh, being a substitute for her, he throws Eve under the bus before God and blames her for his negligence and lack of responsibility. 
And after the fall, God promises to send this seed of the woman, this offspring, to crush or to bruise the serpent's head. And I know you're, you're working through the book of Revelation. And um, look, there is a strong connection here between the events being described in Revelation with uh, the dragon being subjugated and defeated. Um, that, that is the final culmination or fulfillment of God's promise in Genesis 3.15 that the offspring of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Now Jesus is called the second Adam, isn't he? And he redeems this office of divine sonship. This is powerfully demonstrated in the genealogies recorded in the Gospels. I don't know about you, but um, when I was a young Christian, I used to read these genealogies. My eyes would glaze over. <laughs> I, I would uh, really struggle to understand the connection between Jesus and David and Abraham and Adam. Um, and, you know, I'd rather just read Romans 5 or something, you know? Something like that. Give me something so good, you know? No, the genealogies are good because the whole point of them is not to be just pedantic uh, and precise just for the sake of it, but they actually serve to prove a point. They, they show us that God's promise to send a son that would defeat the serpent, that would defeat the devil, is in fact fulfilled in this person, in the, uh, the incarnation, the sufferings, the subsequent glories of the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.18, And Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Hebrews 2, verse 10. For it was fitting that he, uh, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. So look, to tie all of this together, if you are a child of God, you are a recipient of God's redemptive blessings to recreate to redeem the world in His image. You are one of the sons and daughters of God that Christ is bringing into glory as the firstborn of redeemed humanity. And that's a great thing and a glorious blessing. But be warned, bearing the mark of God puts a target on you if you haven't uh, realized that already. Genesis 3.15 shows us there is an enmity between the sons of God and the sons of the devil. The world did not know Christ. You know, Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John 17. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you and these know you that you have sent me. So knowing Christ and through him knowing God the Father by his Spirit is what it means to abide in Christ as a child of God. And when you abide in Christ, when you become one with Christ, you realize that his enemies become your enemies. Uh, but we are to love them, aren't we? We are to love our enemies. But don't expect to be loved by them. The people who killed Jesus, they had the law, the prophets, the covenants of promise, special revelation from God relating to the promised Messiah, but in response, they killed the Lord of glory. So be not surprised that the world treats us similarly. After the restoration of the monarchy in England in um, 1660, religious freedom became more and more restricted. Many of the Puritans were uh, suppressed, they were persecuted for their stance on worship and preaching. And John Bunyan was one of these Puritans. He refused to participate in the state church uh, because he wanted to follow Christ fully. And that mean, meant refusing to participate in uh, worship services that had unbiblical elements, uh, sort of leftover Roman Catholic elements. Instead, he would gather with a small congregation that grew over time called the Bedford Meeting, and he served as their pastor and preacher. Uh, he was, John Owen famously said that he would give up all his learning to preach.
preach like that tinker John Bunyan. He ended up being arrested and ended up serving up to 12 years in prison for his uh, dogged stance on biblical worship. And look, for us, we may not have our lives threatened yet in the post-Christian West, but some of us have lost jobs. Some of us have lost friends, reputation. Family members may have despised us, reviled us, disowned us even. But like John Bunyan, are we willing to stand firm for our convictions and confess God's truth as God's truth? For 2,000 years, the, the uh, church has confessed what it has uh, related to gender or marriage or the life of the unborn. And are we willing to stand and have a backbone and say, no, this is what we believe? Has being a Christian cost you? Not that we should be seeking out suffering or be deliberate martyrs, but there should be a sense in which we have counted the cost. And like the pearl of great price, we sell everything. We consider it all rubbish, like uh, the Apostle Paul, to obtain this great pearl. For us, nothing should lie outside the rule of Christ. Every square inch, says Abraham Kuyper, belongs to him. Now, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who put, uh, with us hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. So now we are shown uh, the now, but not yet aspects of our status as redeemed humanity. And this means that we are God's children right now, if we are believers. But uh, there is an aspect of mystery in the future where the full fulfillment of what this means, the full culmination and satisfaction of what it means to be God's children, uh, hasn't come yet. The kingdom of God has come, but its complete fulfillment has not yet come. Uh, then the, uh, the pronoun he that changes to refer to Christ's appearing, his second coming. When Christ returns at the end of history and raises his people from the dead, believers will be truly transformed into the image of the second Adam. And the logic here is fairly simple. Uh, John's logic is not like Paul's, it's usually a lot more simple. Uh, when Christ appears, we will see Him, and the sight of Christ, often called the beatific vision, is the sight that will make us glad and will purify us from our present sinful bodies. At the coming of Christ, true believers will have glorified, resurrected bodies, a clean character, and satisfied souls. I don't know if you sing this this hymn here, I uh, love divine, I uh, love excelling, the Wesleyan hymn. Change from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. This hope of Christ's coming is often called uh, the eschatological hope. And this kind of hope, when, it, when it's used rightly, it fuels righteous living. It gives us a desire to put to death our sin, to strive for holiness, and to uh, pursue Christ in everything that we do. Knowing our future state in heavenly glory, we will be that much more motivated to live accordingly. What business do we have dabbling with respectable sins? When we will be in the presence of the Lord of glory, who sees and knows all things. What right do we have to continue in secret sins that no one knows about, when he has done away with the sting of death, the curse of sin, and the final enemy? And how can we continue to delight in the pleasures of this world, when God has recreated us for another better world? 
Tertullian, uh, one of the church fathers, he said this, what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? And Paul says this, what does light have to do with darkness? What does Christ have to do with Belial? Not that we can be perfect now, but we repent wholeheartedly and we keep doing it. And we throw ourselves on Christ and we press on. We press on. And in this way, as children of God, we abide in Christ. Now to the second heading, children of God reject the works of the devil. Children of God reject the works of the devil. Look with me, uh, verses 4 to 7. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one keeps on sinning. Who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, do not uh, let no one deceive you. How whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. As I mentioned earlier, there was likely a group of false teachers around at this time uh, that, who taught that lawlessness and sin uh, are fine now that God, the gospel saves us. Now this group of people, uh, this group of false teachers, taught that Christ only appeared uh, to become flesh, but he was really just a spirit. Uh, he didn't actually take on human body. And of course this group was influenced by you know, Greek philosophy, Gnosticism. Uh, this group taught that matter was evil, you know, physical matter was evil, and that because our bodies are made of evil matter, what we do with our bodies ultimately doesn't do, uh, is of no consequence, because we are going to be translated to a higher spiritual plane anyway. So according to this logic, this very flawed logic, um, sexual immorality and other kinds of things was okay, uh, because, um, because of, uh, uh, matter was evil anyway. So John, in this text, is writing to repudiate, to reject these false teachers. John writes this so that we may know, if we make a consistent practice of sin, we actually show we do not know God. What we do with our bodies is of utmost importance. Jesus saves not just our souls, not just our minds and our hearts, but our bodies as well. We are to present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and uh, set apart for God, rejecting the works of the devil. The proof that we have been saved is not just we can uh, say the sinner's prayer, or that we say we believe in Jesus, but that our lives have changed as well. No one who lives in Him will continue sinning in the same way. And look, there are real practical questions to address here. Um, you might be wondering, well, where do you draw the line between a consistent practice of sin and just you know, something that I'm struggling with? And again, please don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about being perfect or sinless, I'm not talking about that kind of thing. To make a consistent practice of sin is to live in it without fighting it, to be content in it. To make a practice of it is to not be able to see any progress, any victories over time. And it means that you don't hate it, it means you love it. Now this improvement, this progress could be slow. And look, in reality it is slow for most Christians. But you should be able to look at, look back, we should be able to look back 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and see that God has transformed us. God has been at work in our lives to increase in us a love for Jesus, a hatred for sin, and an increasing uh, uh, hatred for the things that He hates. Now we're going to skip over to verses 9 and 10, um, because I see a sort of structure here where verses 4 and 7 and 9 and 10 cover a similar theme, while verse 8 sort of forms the main center of the argument. Um, and for, if you're interested, this is a Hebrew literary, literary form 
um, where the main idea is enclosed before and after by the subordinate idea. Um, so let's move to uh, verses 9 and 10 for now. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are children of God, and who are children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Here John repeats the theme of verses 4 to 7, that those born of God cannot continue to practice sin in the same way they used to. We know this just physically, like children look like their parents. It is not a question of if, only a question of which parent, right? (laughs) So do we look like our Heavenly Father? If we do not love our brothers and sisters in Christ, that is evidence that we are not God's children. God is love, and if we have been born of God, there should be a change in us. There should be a disposition to love our neighbor, and especially our brothers and sisters, those in the household of faith. But what if we struggle to love our brothers and sisters? I think we all do at times. Our Christian family can seem so different from us that we feel sometimes we have more in common with others, uh, with other non-Christians. And when we struggle to love our spiritual family, I I find it helpful uh, to remind myself of a couple of things. Firstly, remember that Christ died for this person. They are blood-bought sheep, children of the living God, precious in His sight. Secondly, Christ died for you, Christ died for me, commands us to love our brothers and sisters. And if Christ has forgiven us so much, How much more out of thankfulness and joy ought we to love our imperfect brothers and sisters? Verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Now this verse is awesome. There is so much packed in here. Um, But I'll limit myself to not go on for too long. Firstly, remember what I was saying earlier about Adam and Eve and the serpent in the garden. Well, John clearly alludes again to Genesis 3 in this verse. Um, Jesus himself in John chapter 8 verse 44 calls the men of Israel the son of the devil. And he says the devil was a murderer in the beginning. Secondly, Jesus appeared in his incarnation to take away sin. And yet, despite those false teachers who taught that matter was evil, Jesus taking on a physical body um, because of the work of the Spirit in the uh, conception, it did not take him with sin. He was sinless. His purpose was to come and redeem, to recreate, to bring many sons to glory. And that involves destroying the bondage of sin over his people, destroying the works of the ancient servant. And he did this by suffering, by dying, and by being raised from the dead. And even now, he intercedes for us, doesn't he? Before the throne of God. In the Bible, Israel, uh, the nation of Israel, is also called God's son. While enslaved by the Egyptians, the oppression of the Israelites was so severe that even uh, at one point the firstborn of the Hebrews were put to death. I I think we read this story so often, uh, the kind of gravity of it is lost on us now. Can you imagine um, uh, our state government going and taking all of our firstborn? Uh, That's... That should put it in perspective. Moses, of course, was famously saved by Pharaoh's daughter. The nation of Israel suffered this Egyptian yoke until God raised Moses and performed signs and wonders to call them out of Egypt. And God broke the power of Israel's captors 
and set the nation free, remembering his promise to Abraham. And look, in the same way, God breaks the power of sin in our lives when he calls us out of our Egypt, our sin. Uh, theologians call this work of the Spirit uh, regeneration. The Spirit of God breaks our hard hearts and gives us a heart that is receptive, that wants to know God. Friends, I hope you have experienced this. I hope you've had your heart of stone removed and replaced with a soft heart. I hope that in it you sincerely want to love Christ, uh, not perfectly, but that you seriously do want to love Him and honor Him. Jesus Christ came to deal with the problem of sin by destroying it. If we as Christians continue to play, to dabble with sin, we are welcoming the very thing that Jesus Christ came to destroy. In other words, we, we are betraying our King to his sworn enemy, and a lifestyle of sin is completely contrary to the work of Jesus. Children of God reject these works, the works of the devil, the father of lies, the fruit of his wicked and deceptive ways. Look, there is, uh, you know, let's be honest here, there is a part of us, the Bible calls the flesh, that wars against the spirit. And that flesh uh, causes us to uh, still love our sin in, in some cases, and that is why we cannot treat it lightly. John Owen says this, be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. So how do we kill our sin? Well, the Bible gives us a few pointers. Firstly, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better that you lose one part of your body and your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to go to hell. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with this passage, Jesus is not advocating a kind of physical dismemberment, uh, sanctification through dismemberment. Uh, that is not what is happening here. It is more sanctification through spiritual dismemberment. So, dismembering the things in your life that are setting you back, that are ensnaring you, whatever it is. Secondly, we must love Christ more. It is not enough to cut out those things in our lives, uh, whether it's you know TV or certain kinds of movies or whatever. Um, we must love Christ more. A greater desire for Christ will cause sin to lose its appeal. In engineering, there is this uh, sort of saying, a pig with lipstick on. Uh, that's when you have a really bad system that you try and dress it up for the client to be presented, <laughs> presented as you know. But my point here is that you start to see sin for what it is, a pig. No matter how much lipstick, you, it, it's a pig. And Christ is much greater than that. So we ought to ask God to help us to delight more in Christ. We should have absolutely no desire for sin any of the pleasures of this world. Thirdly, we must be prepared to hold others accountable and to also be held accountable by others. Hebrews 3.13 calls us, exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, because it is deceitful. We need to find trusted Christian brothers and sisters that we can expose ourselves to, especially if we're struggling with a repeated, recurring sin. To close, until Christ appears, abide in Him as children of God, rejecting the works of the devil. Now, we cannot hope to abide in Christ in our own strength. In fact, we have a Savior who has ultimately defeated the enemy of sin and death for us. The early church during the apostolic period uh, was beset from all sides by errors, by lawlessness, uh, by physical persecution. 
And John wrote to remind them that Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. And that those who are born of the Spirit, those who are born of God, are now a new creation. This world is passing away, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. But Christ will return for his bride and create things anew. You know, there is this verse in this hymn, one of my favorite hymns, The Church is One Foundation. It's not often sung, but it, I think it illustrates this truth so well. The church shall never perish, her dear Lord to defend. To guide, sustain, and to cherish is with her to the end. Though there be those who hate her and false sons in her pale, against both foe and traitor she ever shall prevail. The prophets that infect so-called churches will be rooted out, and in the new creation all will only declare the truth about Christ. The sin that would have sent us to eternal judgment in hell has been wiped clean, paid for, thrown into the, the abyss. So take heart, children of God. Our ancient enemy, the serpent, is ultimately defeated. His power over us has been broken by the power of the Lamb. And we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. So. Let us live in this way uh, that reflects this great truth until Christ appears. Abide in Him as children of God and reject the words of the devil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would help us through these things. Help us to know that we are children of God, beloved, set apart, sanctified. And help us to live in a way that is consistent with this truth. Help us to uh, bear witness to the risen Lord Jesus, to our neighbors, our friends. In Christ's name, Amen.